Welcome, happy warriors, to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. Thanks for being part of the show, and uh, you know I appreciate everything that you do to help promote the show. You're, you've obviously been doing absolutely beautifully. I hope that things are going well with you, and um, if you are sort of weighing up already, starting to think about some of the things you're going to want to achieve in the next 12 months, uh, here is something that we've prepared just for you. It's a few minutes a day adds up to a new you. What am I talking about? You know how you sometimes determine with the very best of intentions to improve an aspect of your life? But uh, your inspiration flags a bit. After a while, uh, your motivation diminishes down the road. You, your goal may be to become a better spouse or a better parent or a better friend. It may be to attain a specific skill, increase your income or become more involved in your community. Perhaps you want to live a healthier lifestyle or spend regular time in Bible study. Wanting to do more and to become more is a yearning that... All good people share. Yet, we all know the feeling of looking back after a few months and being a bit disappointed that we seem kind of in the same old place we were earlier. And that's what our product, you Chart Your Course, the journal and the video bundle is designed to help you with. What we do is we provide you a weekly challenge, a Bible reference and inspiration for each week, we help you track your thoughts, actions, and progress throughout the week in the journal. Um, we uh, help you really kind of relish and enjoy your personal growth as you move along week to week. And then we provide a weekly video in which Susan and I introduce an approach to that week's theme, which you will also see in your journal, which is designed to give you a booster shot of motivation. And um, you can see more about this uh, bundle, the, the journal, chart your course journal and video bundle. It's also available with an e-paperback book or an e-book option. Uh, the details, if you have a look at it on our website, it's on a special price. Um, it's, um, I think it's about $20 or maybe something, yeah, something like that. It's, uh, it's really not significant money. We really want it to be accessible to each and everybody. So go to RabbiDanielLappin.com, RabbiDanielLappin.com, and uh, go ahead. Um, today's show is a little bit different. I do this from time to time. It doesn't happen very often, but whenever I have a, an event at which I explain something in a way that I think will be useful and helpful to each of you, uh, I go ahead and make it available. And so uh, I had a chance to do a speech for a um, entrepreneur and finance people program in California recently. And um, they wanted me to talk on what ancient Jewish wisdom is actually good for. <laughs> well, that's a really good challenge. So I did. And um, I wanted to make it available to you as well. So that is what is coming up now. I'll be back with you at the end. And, um, and, uh, but for now, sit back and enjoy it. Let me know what you think. And uh, thank you all for being here. I only have um, a couple of corrections to Peter's kind introduction, and uh, I'll only take time to correct one of them. Um, I think he said that, uh, he said something about me being a theologian uh, or something like that, and, and all I can say is, how dare you, sir? Um, that is possibly the, the biggest insult I've got today. And, and I do collect a, a fair number of them. So uh, uh, what, what's wrong with that is that um, a theologian tells you about God. And um, I couldn't be less interested in what people have to say about God. Uh, I'm a lot more interested in what God thinks about people. But of course, that's nothing to do with theology. So uh, uh, let's start off, if I may, with uh, explaining the nomenclature I'll be using, so we're all talking the same language. And I'm going to use the words physical and spiritual. But allow me to clarify that spiritual has nothing whatsoever to do with virtue or piety or holiness 
or God. Um, spiritual has a very simple and accurate definition. Spiritual is nothing more and nothing less than things that cannot be measured in a laboratory. It's as simple as that. And so gratitude is spiritual. Fortitude is spiritual. The color of my skin, physical and relatively unimportant. If I'm looking to hire somebody to my company, I'm far more interested in their spiritual characteristics than their physical characteristics. I want to know about their integrity. I'm really interested in their persistence. And uh, if they have excellent communication skills, well, that would be spiritual as well. And I, I can't imagine uh, what physical characteristics would interest me uh, you know, unless I was hiring a model for a swimsuit line, which is not the business I'm in. So uh, the characteristics that I, I only care about um, are, in fact, uh, spiritual characteristics. Uh, a saxophone is something physical because I can measure it in any number of ways. I can measure its weight. I can measure its length. I can measure the tone it produces. Uh, I can even measure the precise metallic constitution of its construction. A musical tune, however, while it can be written down and it can be recorded, its essential characteristics are incapable of being measured. So, for instance, uh, there is no way, there is no instrument that can tell you whether a tune is going to make you feel happy or sad. There's no way of plugging a tune into a machine that'll tell you whether that tune is going to be a hit, whether it's a tune that'll make men march to war or bring tears to the eye or make old ladies tap their feet. And none of those things can be measured by an instrument. Uh, music is something intrinsically spiritual. So I hope that that is reasonably clear. And, and the reason it's important is because... Um, we don't get told a lot about spiritual characteristics. Um, as a matter of fact, we live in an odd time in history when the dogma of scientism dominates the culture and the academy. The, uh, the, the dogma of scientism says that nothing exists in the world that cannot be measured. Well, given the, the, uh, the, the, the qualities that I've just been talking about, you'd think that that is a, a demonstrably false uh, proposition. But nonetheless, the dogma of scientism is still strong. The dogma of scientism insists that there's nothing that can ever be wrong with the human being that cannot be corrected uh, chemically with some kind of um, a pharmacological substance. And uh, that would account or help to account for the incredibly high proportion of Americans who are now undergoing some form or another of mental treatment, um, something that was virtually unknown uh, 50 years ago. And so um, as this dogma of scientism spreads, uh, it suggests that um, if, uh, if a man betrays his marriage, the primary reason for that is a chemical one. There is a, a, a wiring reality that makes it an inevitability. In other words, the entire idea of moral choice, which if you're in the finance, if you're all in the financial services industries in, in one way or another, you exercise moral choice several times every single day at your work. And yet, uh, the culture proposes the manifestly preposterous proposition that uh, there is no such thing as anything non-physical. Um, it's, it's ridiculous because so many of the financial decisions, and heaven knows 
many of you know this as well as I do, many of the financial decisions that people make um, are spiritual, not physical. Um, in other words, taken at its most basic, uh, you know, you, you may have a client who spends an enormous amount on, on clothing. And the clothing may have the provenance of, of some distinguished and eminent designer. It may even have a label on it. But it in no way adds to the utilitarian value of that item of clothing. As a matter of fact, the for me personally, the best item of clothing that, uh, that I uh, possess is a set of denim coveralls that I use when working on the engine of my boat. It's really terrific. I, I put my left leg into it. I then put my right leg into it. I then put my left arm into it. And then my right arm. And all of that takes no more time than it takes me to describe it. And then I reach down for a big, long, diagonal brass zip that runs from the lower left to my right shoulder. And I give it one big, long pull. And I am dressed in less than 30 seconds. And it's durable, and it's warm, and it, it, it's terrific. And yet, I don't wear it to the office. Why not? Because our need for clothing is more spiritual than physical. Only a limited part of the reason we wear clothing is to keep us warm and uh, protected. A large part of the reason we wear clothing um, is to retain our dignity. That's spiritual. Sorry, that's not physical. Dignity is an entirely a spiritual proposition. Not wanting to be seen nude, totally spiritual. There's no physical reason for that. Many people overcome it and they spend vacations at nudist colonies and they feel perfectly comfortable, I think. But... Um, Clothing, very little utilitarian purpose, mostly spiritual. And so people spend, by the way, my overalls cost nine ninety five on sale. I don't think I have a more economical and effective piece of clothing in my wardrobe. I actually have three of them. I like them so much. I have more of them than I actually need. But here am I still appearing before you this evening with multiple items of clothing. Multiple. Leaving aside the invisible items of clothing, I've got shirt and pants and jacket, and then I have a tie. And then, for heaven's sake, I've got cufflinks on my wrists. Why? Well, somehow or another, more items of clothing that are non-utilitarian we regard as a more respectful way of dressing. And that is why a man wear, going to a dinner party in a tuxedo will even add to what I'm wearing. He might have a cummerband and he might even have studs on his shirt instead of buttons. The more items of clothing, somehow the more respectful is uh, how you come across and so if I'm going to be appearing before you all this evening and you're investing some of your time with me, why naturally I have to dress in a way that demonstrates respect for you. All this time I've been talking about nothing but spiritual considerations. And uh, when somebody drives across town because gas is three cents a gallon cheaper at a station that their handy little iPhone tells them about, that's a spiritual need, not a physical need, because they're using more gas driving there and back than they're saving. But there are many people who have a deep-seated desire to get a bargain and to get a deal. And in any event, you've heard of retail therapy. You've probably got clients who overindulge in it. Shopping feels good, but it's a purely spiritual feeling. And so... It's, it's really important that if you want to live and operate effectively in this world of ours, that you develop a sense of how the world really works. 
and it is impossible to operate effectively if you are utterly ignorant of spiritual realities. Now, it's so serious and so significant that we even have to spend a couple of moments, if you will, on the question of whether money itself is spiritual or physical. Now, can money be measured? Well, uh, the, the, the first thought that occurs to me as well you know, I, I drop it into the slot machine on a vending machine at the end of the floor in my hotel, uh, in, on my hotel floor, and that vending machine knows whether I fed in a dollar or five dollars. It knows whether I've dropped a quarter in the slot or a dime in the slot. So it looks as if money can be measured, but wait. What's being measured is a strip of colored paper and a metallic disc. But those are not, are not really the essence of money. Because if somebody writes me a check for $10, he's also given me money. And um, if somebody shakes hands with me and says, I'll give you $10 on Friday, that's also money. And the orientation of iron oxide molecules on that brown strip behind my credit card First. Well, that's money also. And the ones and zeros on the hard drive at my financial institution, well, that's money too. And so it becomes very difficult to define exactly what money is. And so one way of establishing that it is spiritual, not physical, is because one of the rules is that in order to impact anything physical, I actually have to be in physical proximity to do it. And so um, a, uh, a car windshield is very physical. And if I want to damage somebody's car windshield, I need a hammer and I need to be right there. But uh, how about if I want to damage your money? Well, here's a way I could do it. While we're talking here, one of my associates is putting the word out that the world is coming to an end tomorrow. A meteorite is going to strike the planet at 12 noon, and it's all over. And you may as well relax about it. It's inevitable. And uh, the truth is we've had a pretty decent ride up till now. And it's not as if you're being singled out. It's getting the Jews and the Baptists and everybody else. It's all over for everybody. And if enough people in our neighborhood, in our city, in our state, and maybe even in our country, if enough people believe that the world is coming into an end tomorrow, what have I done to the value of your assets at this moment? Would you agree that I've dramatically reduced the value of your assets? Go and try and sell your real estate tomorrow morning and see what happens. There's nobody going to be interested in buying your real estate. There's only another four or five hours of the world to exist. And so merely by putting out a rumor and by changing the way people feel about the future, I have seriously damaged your wealth just as reliably as I damaged the windshield of that car. And that's really, really important to understand. That tells us that the essence of money is its value and the value of money is entirely spiritual it um, it cannot be measured the only way it can be measured is by a marketplace of other human beings there's no instrument in any lab that can tell you the value of your money you want to find it out look at the prices in the supermarket oh inflation well, what's inflation, a physical or a spiritual problem? Well, inflation, regardless of uh, attempts on the part of certain economists um, and certain politicians who will advance 
such nonsense as modern monetary theory, which holds that the government can print as much money as it likes because it has the power to do so, and there's nothing to worry about. Uh, the, the reality is that prices go up when governments print more money than the aggregate economic productivity of the sovereign area in which that money is the prime means of exchange warrants. Again, an entirely spiritual problem. Why on earth would governments print more money than they should? Well, because it's a uh, penalty-free way of taxing people. You just have to inflate the currency and everyone's going to be paying more in taxes. They move up into different brackets. The, uh, the amount of money that people make in numbers goes up. Their taxes go up and there's no penalty to be paid at the ballot box at the next election because nobody realizes that their money is being stolen. They assume it is some bizarre, mystifying, economic um, subterfuge, something weird. It just happens. It's like an earthquake. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. And so even an, a correct understanding of money depends on an understanding of the spiritual and the physical. Um, taking it a, a step further, if, uh, if you're all with me up till now, going a little bit further, um, we can take a look at two different classifications of knowledge. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to tell you a few things, and you can tell me whether those th these things, let's just put it this way, can these things be accurately predetermined? That, that'll be a good preliminary step to understand what it is we're looking at. So to give you an example, um, can, I mean, a parent knows their children, right? A parent knows their child. Can you predict the behavior of your child in a certain set of circumstances? And the answer is, uh, to a degree. Uh, I can't predict it 100%. My children are little human beings with independent agency. And I, I have a sense, but I can't guarantee. How about the quantity of electrical current that'll be induced in a coil in which I move a magnet rapidly. If I know the details of the coil and I know the distances and I know the exact nature of the movement of my magnet, can I predict the amount of current that'll flow in that coil? Absolutely. So those are two examples of knowledge where the first one is a, a sort of, yeah, but it's, it can't be measured. I can't, I can't give you any guarantees. I kind of know, but not reliably. The second one is quite reliable. Um, I, I know my 357 Magnum Revolver very well. I also have access to the mathematics of parabolic flight. If I fire my revolver at a 45 degrees angle into the air, and I know the muzzle velocity of the round, and I know that gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, and this all takes place in a vacuum so I don't have to worry about air resistance, to what accuracy can I predict the point where that bullet will come down to earth? High or low? High, low. Very high. I can, I can probably predict it to the inch. You know, e even though it might be 200 yards down range. But if there's no air resistance and I know all the parameters, I can predict it absolutely reliably. Um, if um, uh, a conductor knows his orchestra, it's a little bit like the, the parent and child problem. Conductor knows his orchestra. 
Can he predict every night exactly how the symphony is going to come out? No. They're, they're unpredictable. They're things you can't possibly know. Uh, the um, uh, If I construct, if I'm the Boeing company and I construct an airplane, with what degree of certainty can I predict its flight characteristics? High or low? High. Absolutely, no question about it. The Boeing company does not deliver a 777 airliner to uh, Lufthansa Airlines and says to them, guys, you got about a 98% probability that this airplane will stay airborne. That's not how it works. It's 100%. And one of the reasons the air travel is so incredibly safe and reliable is because they've nailed this down. It's absolutely solid. If um, if uh, we build a ship, not counting the Titanic and icebergs, but if we build a ship, shipyard builds a ship, how high is the probability that it'll float when they launch it? Not only is it a high probability, but they even know exactly where to paint the waterline. And then when they launch it, Darned if it doesn't float exactly on that waterline. These things are predictable and they're reliable. And somebody shows you a business plan and they're going to start a business based on that business plan. How high or low is the probability that that business is going to succeed? Well, if we just look at the statistics of new business, we know that even though I know the principles and I've seen the business plan and I, I know what their capital structure is, even so, the rate of success cannot be guaranteed. And what's more, if that same business plan was transferred to another set of principles, that makes it even more uncertain. Yet, if the Boeing company builds a 777 with a different set of workers than they used for the first one that came off the line eight years ago, it makes no difference. So, you've got to ask yourself, what's the difference between a magnet in a coil of wire or building an airplane or building a ship and starting a business. How about a man and a woman come and tell you uh, they've got engaged and they're getting married? And you congratulate them and you buy them a fish slice for an engagement present. And, um, and then the man is a friend of yours, comes to you and says, by the way, what, are, what do you think are our chances of uh, remaining married for the next 20 years? Do you have any way of knowing? You can ask all the questions you like. You still don't know. So starting a business and starting a marriage seem to have very low prediction rates. They may well be very successful, but you don't know for sure in advance. But building a bridge or a boat or an airplane or a skyscraper, very high um, prediction prediction of success rates. You 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 know, and by the way, the converse is somebody, an amateur might show you the plans for a house, and if you're an experienced builder, uh, you might well say, "This is a disaster. Don't build this." And he says, "Ah, you're just such a pessimist. Um, I've been dreaming of this house for years. It's going to be just fine," you know, and. And the house isn't fine. It, it leaks and the foundation shifts and the walls crack. And, you know, you want to say, I told you so, because it's reliable. So you have to ask yourselves now, what is the difference between, on the one hand, buildings, and, and skyscrapers and airplanes, bridges and boats, and on the other hand, 
things like marriages and businesses. What is the difference? Well, the difference, as I'm sure all of you are shouting out at me, but your microphones are muted, fortunately, so I don't know, is that um, when you deal with physical objects, everything is always very predictable because the so-called scientific method is quite reliable. But whenever we deal with human beings, we're dealing with spiritual issues because human beings are predominantly spiritual, not physical. Oh yes, I have a body, no question about it. And that body has needs and desires, no question about it. But it also has spiritual needs and desires, and those are a lot harder to know something about. Because if you're deprived of a physical need like oxygen, you start gasping very quickly, and so you know that you need some oxygen. If you're deprived of food, well, you know pretty quickly. The pangs of hunger let you know. But if you're deprived of your dignity, you don't always know. And when you're deprived of a sense of the infinite, and I deal with this very often with men who've had vasectomies, there's something fundamentally different about men and women. For a woman, the idea of the infinite is linked to one egg a month. With a man, the infinite is linked to the idea of a hundred million of them a day. That's quite a difference. And so when doctors told my clients, you don't have to worry. There is no change whatsoever that you will know about if you've had a vasectomy. Well, if that were true, you wouldn't have a huge number of people trying to get vasectomy reversals because there is a difference. The doctors were right from a scientific point of view. The doctors were right from a materialistic point of view. The doctors were right from a physical point of view. But they didn't know anything about the spiritual impact. You know, when um, uh, Ray Kroc met Richard and Maurice MacDonald in uh, the early 1950s, he loved the way they were making hamburgers and he wanted to get involved with them. And so they hired him as their franchise manager. And um, he got going. He, uh, he took their system of preparing fast food and he started working on franchising. And he very quickly made them nervous because they were envisaging opening about four or five McDonald's all around the West, California and adjoining states, but no more than four or five stores. They lacked a vision of the infinite. And they felt uncomfortable with the idea of the infinite. And they wanted to keep things relatively confined and controllable. Ray Kroc was a guy who thought infinitely. He saw tens of thousands of franchises. Eventually, he got so frustrated, he said, I, I, I either have to stop working with you or you have to sell the business to me. And, uh, and they both said to him, we'd be happy to sell to you, but the trouble is we each need a million. Now, admittedly, in 1954, a million was money, but uh, not compared to what they would have had had they stayed in, even as small shareholders. And so he gave them each $1.7 million, which after tax gave them each a million. And Richard and Maurice McDonald said goodbye and went off into the sunset. And Ray Kroc built the McDonald Corporation. A vision of the infinite is one of the spiritual necessities. By the way, I'm not saying that a man who's had a vasectomy cannot function with a vision of the infinite. It's just a little harder. It comes more easily naturally to a man who produces millions of sperm every day. It's, it's just a spiritual aspect of how we're built, and it's an aspect of how the physical and the spiritual interlock in the reality of life. And so, um, uh, artificial intelligence, big, big talking point now 
a huge amount of capital has been raised for AI, a huge amount. Uh, Microsoft are the owners of, um, of ChatGBT and, and uh, other aspects of the AI industry. Um, the, um, uh, the chip manufacturer um, with an N that his name eludes me just for the moment. NVIDIA. NVIDIA, thank you. Yes, uh, thanks very much. Uh, chip manufacturer that, that makes most of the chips used in AI architecture doing very, very well indeed. But, um, but you might remember that a, a, a few years ago, General Motors started an AI division um, for the production of autonomous cars. And they projected uh, $50 billion in earnings from that subsidiary alone by 2030. The subsidiary's name is Cruise. And uh, in 2021, two years ago, the uh, pre-money valuation of Cruise was $30 billion when they did a round of financing. Um, about a month ago, maybe two months ago, the California Department of Motor Vehicles suspended the operations of Cruz, the subsidiary for General Motors, the uh, artificial intelligence subsidiary, because it turned out that um, a, a fellow driving a, a regular car struck a woman, a woman and the, uh, the collision threw her into the path of an oncoming autonomous cruise vehicle, which immediately stopped. But then it started trying to move to the curb and drag the woman 20 yards to the curb, thereby killing her. And, um, and so goodbye cruise, goodbye $30 billion valuations, uh, because there are certain things artificial intelligence is very good at, and there are other things it's very, very bad at. Artificial intelligence would be very good at helping to design the waterline for ocean-going freighters, for building airplanes and for designing buildings and bridges. AI would be great for that and is. AI is very good for pulling defective items off an assembly line. Um, but AI wouldn't be very good at predicting the success of a business plan. AI wouldn't be very good at telling a couple what their chances are of a successful marriage or what they should do to achieve it. And at the moment, because everybody has been so conditioned to the idea of um, scientism dogma, that everything can be resolved scientifically, which is sheer nonsense, but people have bought into it so completely, academia, the culture, <laughs> commerce, politics, um, that uh, there is a lack of clarity as to where AI can add value and where it cannot add value. But uh, these are things that um, become far easier to understand and to analyze um, when you do have an understanding of the, the spiritual side of reality as well. And so I think that uh, Peter had entitled the lecture the, the Value of Ancient Jewish Wisdom if, if I remember correctly, and if not, I apologize, Peter, but, uh, but uh, the, the value of, um, of ancient Jewish wisdom um, is not theology and it's not, uh, it's, it's not uh, how, to, how to make God smile on you and make sure he doesn't strike you with lightning. Um, it's primarily an understanding and an insight into the spiritual aspects of how the world really works. And we have to understand that modernity is only significant on the physical side of the spectrum. But on the spiritual side of the spectrum, modernity is irrelevant. And so uh, I might tell you, as I'm telling another group tomorrow evening, uh, some of the um, uh, the secrets of sharing a bed and a bank account, which is an accurate depiction of marriage. Marriage is both sexual and economic. It's both sexual and financial. Love? Did somebody say love? <laughs> no, don't be ridiculous. That's not the issue. No, 
No, it's, uh, it's sex and money, and that's one of the reasons why it is that even after more than 50 years of feminism and sexual egalitarianism, the overwhelming majority of couples that are getting engaged today, tomorrow, this month, next year, last year, the majority of them, the overwhelming majority of them, get engaged because the man goes down on one knee and holds out a ring to a girl and says, would you accept this ring and make me the happiest man in the universe? How come after 60 years of gender egalitarianism, we don't have 50% of marriages coming about that way, and the other 50% of marriages coming out because a woman goes down on one knee, holds out a gold Rolex to a guy, and says, accept this Rolex, marry me and make me the happiest woman in California. It doesn't happen. It's almost always a disaster. As a matter of fact, there is a cruel genre of uh, videos on YouTube of female proposals that went horribly wrong. And they do mostly go horribly wrong. That's because people overlook the financial aspect. And the financial aspect is different for men than it is for women. These And people say to me, what are you talking about? This is the 21st century. And my answer... Well, it's not the 21st century, actually, because it does actually tie back to the Torah and to the Baba Kama. Historically, women were not included in business. So it is a bit of a difference. Want to be in there. Um, actually, actually, nothing could be further from the truth. And if you like, uh, we, we, you know, we can certainly discuss and debate that. But um, uh, the, the basic idea was as true a hundred years ago and a thousand years ago, and it'll be as true a hundred years time into the future, is that women are uncomfortable with men who have less economic resources than they do. As a matter of fact, the stats are un, uh, un, unarguable on this. The, the data is absolutely persuasive that um, uh, women, wives who dramatically out-earn their husbands, doom the marriage. The marriage does not survive very long. As a matter of fact, a new study just came out a month ago. I was fascinated by this one, that when wives win major lottery winnings, uh, the marriage ends within the next year or two. When men earn a substantial lottery winnings, the marriage gets enhanced. Anyway, why do, why do I tell you all this? Because modernity doesn't apply to the spiritual f areas we're talking about. You want to talk about Are man... Are you sure that doesn't have anything to do with women's ability to obtain a get? What, do you, what has that got to do with this? Say, explain to me. Orthodox Jewish tradition has not traditionally allowed women to exit a marriage as smoothly as it has for a man. Absolutely correct. And the reality is that women can't enter a marriage as smoothly as men either. In other words, correct. Um, you know, no, no man sits at home on a Saturday night waiting for the phone to ring uh, because he hasn't got a date. If he's a man, he initiates it. For women, that is a lot harder because whether you are proposing marriage or proposing a date, it is much more difficult for a woman to do than for a man. These are realities that haven't changed one little bit. And so uh, whether we're talking about parent-child relationships, male-female relationships, sibling relationships, uh, whether we're speaking about the relationship of a person with their money, these are not things that have changed. Uh, the amount, the number of days my grandfather spent traveling on the road for business is pretty much the same as I do. Except I travel in, a, in luxury and I stay at a lovely hotel and he traveled on you know, a third class compartment on a European train and stayed in, in a farmer's barn. But the basic idea that you very often have to travel in order to make money hasn't changed. And the number of days that a typical married man is willing to spend on the road hasn't changed very much either, studies show. So that's kind of interesting. But um, uh, the, the, the point is that so much of life, whether it's in the relationship area, whether it's in the financial area, whether it's in the commercial arena, transactions and so on, so much of that 
hinges on the spiritual and not the physical, even getting all the way down to the clothing that we wear. And so uh, what we, uh, you know, what I speak about in, in both the book that Peter mentioned earlier, as well as my most uh, current book, which is just out, it's called The Holistic You. And uh, this is the, the subtitle of the book is How to Integrate Your Family, Your Finances, Your Fitness, Your Friendships, and Your Faith into Your Life. And uh, again, that's a spiritual concept that um, we are, as human beings, we are complex systems in exactly the same way that a modern motor car is a very complex system. And uh, if I buy a Hyundai Accent, a perfectly admirable car for its price range, and I decide that I want to improve it, and I purchase an aftermarket um, a 10 cylinder W configuration, six liter engine that powers the Bentley and the top end Audi, and I install that in place of the one and a half liter four cylinder in line that my Hyundai Accent used to have. And I think to myself, well, this is a neat little improvement. You know, my buddy next door just painted on racing stripes on his Hyundai. I have changed the engine for a much better engine. He, has he improved his car? He actually hasn't. The fuel supply won't work. The, uh, the connection with the transmission won't work. The suspension won't carry the weight. He's made a mess of it. You cannot work on just one part of a complex system at a time. And one of the reasons that um, in the medical profession this, th there is a growing awareness of the holistic aspect of health, the whole area um, of uh, um, uh, people um, being playing a role in medical tests where half the people get a real uh, tablet with pharmacological efficacy and the others get a sugar tablet as a, um, a sort of placebo. And then it turns out very often that for many people, the placebo actually has the effect that the patient was told it would have, in spite of the fact that from a physical perspective, there is no such thing. It happens nonetheless, because we are complex, holistic creatures. So um, that is uh, the area I specialize in. Um, I consult for businesses uh, on focusing on the holistic aspect of every aspect of business, uh, the, um, and the spiritual nature of money, and above all, the, what I call the five F's of successful living. Um, a strong relationship with family, and that also means sexual, obviously, right? Because the whole, I mean, sex is the basis of family. The only reason you had a nice Thanksgiving family meal, which I hope you did, and the only reason uncles and aunts and cousins and nephews and nieces were there is because many years ago, grandpa and grandma caught one another's eye across the room and later found ecstasy in one another's arms. I mean, that's why, that's why there's a family. And so uh, we speak about uh, building effective relationships, family-wise, finance-wise, fitness-wise, physical fitness-wise, uh, friendship-wise, our social and, uh, and uh, civic connections, and then uh, finally our faith connections as well. And, um, and the bottom line is that uh, if you've got no financial worries and you have a terrific marriage and a lovely family and you've got great friends and you're in reasonably good physical health and you're okay with your creator as well, you don't have much to complain about in life. And uh, that is the circumstances I wish for each and every one of you. Uh, my gratitude to you for spending time with me this evening. And um, certainly if there's time, um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Otherwise, if you want to call it night, that's also okay. Well, there it was. I hope you enjoyed that. And um, let me know what you think. That's what the comment section on the We Happy Warriors website is for. You're not yet a happy warrior? What? Come on. Join us. It's a community of people who are trying to progress 
as we all are in our five F's. So um, that brings us to the end of today's show. Until we meet next time, I am your rabbi urging you onwards and upwards in your family and in your finances, in your faith, in your fitness, and your friendships. God bless.